chapter 1 and uh, Revelation chapter 22. And I'd like to uh, finish the message that I started today, or this morning, and uh, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3, and then we'll look at Revelation 22 verse 7. Revelation chapter 1 verse 3, blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And then Revelation 22, 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Father, we do thank you for your word. We pray you'll bless now the preaching of the word of God. Have your perfect will, Father, in each and every heart and life. And Father, help us to be what you would have us to be, uh, Lord, in these last days, we pray in Jesus' precious name, and amen. We read here in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, where the Bible says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And then Revelation 22, 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. As I mentioned this morning, uh, Revelation is the only book in the Bible where God uh, promises a blessing to those who read and hear and keep the things that are written in this book. Now we get a blessing from reading all of the Bible, but Revelation says specifically that there is a blessing to those that read and hear and keep those things that are written therein. And I started a message this morning on the blessings of the Bible. The blessings of the Bible. And we went over the fact that the Bible, first of all, is a library. It's a library. And uh, we gave you several things about that. Paul talked about uh, the parchments and the books. He told Timothy to bring the parchments uh, and the books in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 13 the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. So Paul looks like had a library, but I want to tell you something, folks. We got the greatest library in the world right here in these 66 books uh, in the Bible. Uh, Patrick Henry said this, if I could leave each of my children a million dollars, but could not leave them a heritage of faith in God, I would leave them nothing of value and unfit to face life. The Bible is worth more than all other books which has ever been printed. Yeah. Amen. Uh, Patrick Henry said that. I want to tell you what, thank God uh, for the Word of God. And then we've seen that the, the blessings of the Bible, the Bible is not only a library, but the Bible is a landscape. It's a landscape. In other words, it gives us a panoramic view of God's dealing with man. And we went over the fact that, I mean, just in a nutshell, we see obviously in Genesis the creation, the creation of man, how God created man. Man did not evolve. Man didn't come from a monkey or a gorilla. Man came from, he was created by God in the image of God. Genesis 1 talks about it. And then uh, man fell. He sinned against God and he fell. And then, uh, <clears throat> of course, God clothed him there. And uh, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve fell, he clothed them with coats of skins there. And then, of course, we see throughout the Old Testament under the law there that the priests would stand daily and would offer sacrifices daily. And they would uh, never take away sins, though the, the, it is impossible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins, Hebrews 10, 1 to 4 talks about. So thank God the Lord Jesus Christ shows up 2,000 years ago, sheds his blood, died on the cross, was buried and rose again the third day, ascended back up to God the Father. He's getting ready to come back. We're in the church age dispensation right now, and God has temporarily set aside the nation of Israel, Romans 11, 25 and 26. Blindness in part has happened to Israel. That doesn't mean that Jews can't be saved. 
but it just means that they've been set aside and God is primarily dealing with Gentiles. And then once the rapture takes place, <clears throat> we find out that God will start dealing with that Jew again in the tribulation. And that Jew has to endure until the end, uh, Matthew 24, 13. And uh, pray that your flight be not in the winter. Uh, don't go in the house and get your stuff. He said there in Matthew 24, and flee into the mountains and all that. And he said, for such there'll be a time that never was on this earth. Matthew 24, verse 21. And then Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. So that's doctrine and tribulation of Matthew 24. So the Lord's going to come back. We're going to come back with him in Revelation 19 on white horses. And he's going to set up a thousand year millennial reign. And he's going to wipe out the armies at the Battle of Armageddon and set up a thousand year reign. According to Revelation 19, the devil will be, uh, he will be uh, chained there in Revelation chapter 20. And uh, he will be, uh, uh, he will be all chained up there. And, uh, and then for a thousand years, and of course, uh, then of course, Revelation 21 and 22 goes on, talks about eternity on out to eternity. So that's a, a panoramic view of landscape that we mentioned this morning. And there's uh, number three. The Bible is a love letter. The Bible is a love letter. And uh, in other words, the Bible, uh, it'd be like a love letter, but a husband or, you know, a fiance would send a man that's going to marry a woman, you know, send her a letter or vice versa. And uh, they read the letter and they love to read the letter because it's from the one they love. And of course, this Bible is from the one we love, from God himself. And it's a, it's a love letter. We went over the fact that the Bible says that God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, Ephesians 2, 4. And so we see here that uh, the Bible is a, uh, a love letter. And then uh, number four, we see, uh, I want to say this, number four is that the Bible uh, is a listening post. You say, what do you mean a listening post? It's a listening post in that uh, it's where we can go to hear the voice of God. Now, a lot of people talk about hearing the voice of God, but what they tell you that they heard that God supposedly told them contradicts 300 verses of Scripture. Amen. But anyways, uh, we got a lot of that going on around the country. And uh, thank God that we have the voice of God here in the good old King James Bible. Amen. Amen. And so it's where we can go to hear uh, the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord is mentioned throughout the Bible. I, I mean, we'd be here all night if I went through uh, even half the verses that talked about God's voice. But God's voice, according to the Bible, is saw, or, uh, Job 37, 1 to 6, and John 12, 28 and 29 it sounds like thunder. When God spake out of heaven, people said that it thundered. And God's voice uh, sounds like thunder out of heaven, according to the Bible. And uh, so, uh, look, turn to Psalms 29. I'll just show you a, couple, a few verses here. In Psalms 29, about the voice of the Lord. Psalms 29, and look here at verse 1. Psalms 29, verse 1. And this talks about the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord is mentioned all through here. Psalms chapter 29. And uh, look at verse 3. Psalms 29, 3. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. See, there he is. He thunders. That's how God's voice sounds. It sounds like thunder. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. <clears throat> the voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian, like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calve and discovereth the forest. And in his temple doth every one speak of his glory. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. 
The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. So the voice of the Lord is mentioned uh, throughout the Bible there. Let's go back to Revelation uh, chapter 1. And so the uh, number four, the voice of the Lord is a listening post. And uh, several times in the Gospels and in the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ would say, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. What he's talking about there, as I've mentioned many times, he's not talking about if you have a physical ear, because everybody has a physical ear on the side of your head, unless you, you know, you were born without ears, or you, uh, you know, you, had, you were in some kind of an accident or something, that type of thing. But generally speaking, uh, most people have physical ears on the side of their head. The Lord wasn't saying if you have a physical ear, he's talking about a spiritual ear to hear God. And a lot of people in America today do not have a spiritual ear to hear God. God is speaking to them about salvation. God is speaking to them about service. God's speaking to them about uh, soul winning and witnessing. God's speaking to them about getting the gospel out, getting gospel tracts out, and trying to do something to reach other people uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ. God is speaking to them about their supplication and prayer life, whatever it might be. And so the uh, Bible, the blessing of the Bible is it's not only a library and a landscape and a love letter, but it's a listening post, a listening post where we can go to hear the voice of God. I want to tell you something, folks. There, there's, there's no other voice like God's voice. I mean, the voice of God speaking, I'm going to tell you, it's like no other voice. Some people, some people in the same family, they sound like a lot of times a son will sound like his dad. You know, especially telephone. They say, well, I thought that I thought this was your dad. Or you know, a daughter will sound like the mother, you know, and or another family member. But I'm gonna tell you something. The voice of God, there's no other voice that sounds like the voice of God. Amen. That still small voice. Look if you would at first Kings chapter uh, 17 back in the old testament. First Kings uh, chapter 17, and look here at first Kings. First uh, Kings, uh, I'm sorry, First Kings 19. First Kings 19, and uh, notice it says in First Kings 19, verse eight, and he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Mount unto Horeb, the Mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Verse 11, And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount." Before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break it uh, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. There's nothing like the voice of the Lord. A still, small voice. I believe with all my heart. Now I know God speaks to us. He speaks to us through His Word. The blessings of the Bible is that it's a listening post. And I believe that God will speak to you. That's why the devil doesn't want you to read the Bible. Because he knows that God will speak to your heart. He knows that God will speak to you. And you say, well, I'm afraid God might speak to me. He might deal with me about my sin. Hey, that's, that's the best thing. God can get that sin out of our heart and life. And uh, we can do something for, uh, for the glory of God. Let's go back to Revelation. And, and then number five, I want to say this. The Bible is a law. It's a law that tutors and teaches us the way of righteousness and the paths that we need to avoid. The Bible is a law. Now there are a ton of verses in the Bible, especially like in Psalms and in Proverbs 
The Bible talks about God's law, His Word, over and over and over again. A law that tutors and teaches us the way of righteousness and the paths that we need to avoid. Uh, the law of God. Look back a few books from Revelation in James chapter 1. And let me show you over here. Uh, Revelation, uh, or James chapter 1. And look here at James chapter 1 and verse 22. Uh, James chapter 1, and look at verse uh, 21. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul, your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And then look at James 2, verse 10. <clears throat> For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. You see that? The Word of God is a it's a light. It's a uh, or a law. It's, it's a law of God. And uh, just like the law, if you go down the road, it says 55 miles an hour. You break the law, you have to pay. You have to pay the fine or whatever. I mean, some laws you break, you go to jail, you go to prison for extended periods of time. It depends on the uh, offense and the you know uh, the degree of uh, the offense that you committed. But uh, the the blessing of the Bible is that it's a a law, a law of God, and it has lots of laws in it. And uh, the Sunday school teacher was describing how Lot's wife looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. Little Johnny, he was much interested, and he said to the teacher, he said, my mommy looked back once while she was driving, and, and, and she turned into a telephone pole. Amen? <laughs> That's the law, brother. And uh, you can't hit the telephone pole. Amen? And uh, so the, the blessing of the Bible is that it's a law, a law of God, but it, it's not a law that so much as to like get us mad and upset. We, we quoted the other day in a message, for his commandments are not grievous, 1 John 5, 3. It's good. God's commandments are not grievous. God doesn't sit up there and say, I wonder how I can make their life totally miserable. I just want to make them miserable. I don't want them to have any joy. God doesn't say, thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not, don't do that, don't do this, avoid this, avoid that. He doesn't say that. He don't have all these laws in the Bible uh, for us for to be grievous and to be grievous unto us and uh, to be burdensome. He does it uh, for our benefit. So when you go down the road and the, and the speed limit says, you know, you're in a residential area, so it, it says 35, they don't want you going 50 or 60 or even 45 because when you go too fast, there's kids and there's a congestion congestion. Uh, uh, you know, traffic and so forth, and uh, and and there's houses everywhere. So they they got a speed limit that pertains to the area that you're in, and so if you go over that, then uh, bad things can take place. So the the Bible is a a law that tutors and teaches us the way of righteousness and the paths to avoid. And then let me say this: that the Bible. Uh, the blessing of the Bible is that it is a light. It is a light. Psalms 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I want to thank God we can hold that word of God out there like a lamp in a dark area. We can hold it out there and it'll show us which way to go and which way not to go. The word of God is a light. It's a lamp. There's a ton of verses on that. And I certainly don't want to start reading and quoting all the verses pertaining to that. We'd be here all night. But the Word of God is like a lamp. It's like a, uh, it's like a light. Uh, <clears throat> back on Newsweek magazine years ago, in December 27, 1983, uh, Newsweek said this. 
I mean, you could tell this was 34 years ago. Perhaps even more than the Constitution, it said, the Bible is our founding document, the source of the powerful myth of the United States as a special sacred nation, a people called by God to establish a model society, a beacon to the world. It's like a light, a light. The United States and for years and years has been like a beacon on a hill, like a light, a lamp on a hill for light for other nations. It says, goes on. Bible study, this is in Newsweek magazine 34 years ago. Bible study was the core of public education and nearly every literate family not only owned a Bible, but read it regularly and reverently. <clears throat> Today, the Bible has virtually disappeared from American education. Right. And it has. Matter of fact, you're, I don't even think you're allowed to have a Bible in the schools, are you? You'll get sued by the ACLU, which is a wicked, filthy, perverted, ungodly organization. It is rarely studied, the Bible, even as literature in public classrooms. In other words, you're allowed to have all these other books, the Koran and the Muslim books, and these all the other books of these other religions, but God forbid that our kids would have the word of God in the schoolrooms and look at the mess that our public schools are in in America today. Amen. The teachers, a lot of, in a lot of these cities, the teachers are scared to death. I mean, I feel sorry for them. I feel sorry for them. And so the word of God is a light. It is a light. Robert E. Lee, he said, in all my perplexities and distresses, the Bible has never failed to give me light and strength. Light and strength. You say, I need some light on some decision situations. Get your nose in the Bible, folks. Amen. Get your nose in the Word of God and study that Bible. Read that Bible. You say, I don't really get a whole lot out of it. Oh, it'll get a lot out of you. Amen. And you That's just right. read it. Yeah. You just read it. And I'll tell you what, it'll do something for you. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's a light. And then the next thing I want to say is, is that the Word of God is a lifeline. Or it's living. It's a lifeline. For the Word of God is quick and powerful. Quick, it's alive. Quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4, verse 12. So here we have it's a lifeline. I want to thank God that my Bible's a lifeline. Listen to this. You're going to shout and run the aisles on this one. The three greatest periods of English history came when national recognition was given <clears throat> to the Bible as God's Word. Number one, during the reign of Alfred the Great, he translated part of the Bible, England rose from barbarism, division, and ignorance into a united, civilized nation. Number two, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, she at first officially promoted the circulation of the Bible. England became a world power for the first time. Number three, during the reign of Queen Victoria, the empire climbed to its zenith in power and territory. Listen to this. When asked by a foreign prince the secret of her country's greatness, Queen Victoria replied, The Bible, my Lord, is the secret of our greatness. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Man, if we get back to the Word of God. Right. If we get back to the Word of God, she says, I mean, that's what they call him, our Lord back in. You know, I know people get upset about that because God's the only Lord. That's the way this Queen this Victoria stuff. When asked by a foreign prince the secret of her country's greatness, Victoria replied, the Bible, my Lord, is the secret of our greatness. It's the secret of our greatness. And I want to tell you what, any country's greatness, the secret of it is the Word of God. Yeah, yeah. The secret of any church. You know why a lot of these, and I'm not trying to be mean, but a lot of these Christian universities and colleges and even churches that were great churches and Christian universities in the past 
50 or 75 or 100 years. You want to know why they're either closed up or their enrollment has gone down to practically nothing? Or if they are still in existence, they don't have enough power to blow themselves out of a wet paper bag because they've rejected the King James Bible. You say, well, it's got to be more to it than that. That's primarily it. It might be a lot of other little things with it, but it's primarily a rejection of the Word of God. Primarily rejecting the Word of God. T. DeWitt Talmage, a great preacher many years ago, he said, every great book that has been published since the first printing press was invented has directly or indirectly derived much of its power from the sacred oracles. In other words, the Word of God. Amen? T. DeWitt Talmage. I'll tell you what, I want to thank God that I got the Bible. I want to thank God that the man that led me to the Lord showed me and told me that the King James Bible was the Word of God. That I didn't get all fouled up in all these other versions. I want to praise the Lord for that. And thank God for that. Amen. During one of the most critical periods of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln wrote to his friend Joshua Speed. That was his name, Joshua Speed. And he said this, Lincoln said, I am profitably engaged in reading the Bible. Take all of this book upon reason that you can and the balance upon faith and you will live and die a better man. You see that? But you know what? We got all these people, these revisionists, they're trying to rewrite history. They're trying to make you think that most or all of our presidents were a bunch of wacko, left-wing, weirdo, uh, homosexuals or sodomites or something, you know, agnostics. Or I mean, There might have been a few of them, but I'm going to tell you what, a lot of them were Christians that love God and believe the Bible. Amen. Yeah, yeah. I want to say that one of the blessings of the Bible is that it's a lifeline. A lifeline. A lifeline is a rope to which a drowning sinner may be pulled to eternal safety through Jesus Christ. It's a light, L-I-G-H-T, I mentioned a few minutes ago. A light that gives guidance in the midst of the dark perplexities of life and the fog of confusion. You ever been in the fog of confusion? This, this Bible will give you light. It's a lifeline. And then I want to say this, it's a liberator. It's a liberator. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free... You shall be free indeed in John 8, 32 and 36. Jesus said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Horace Greeley said it is impossible mentally and socially to enslave a Bible reading people. The principles of the Bible are the groundwork of human freedom. Praise God for the word of God. In colonial America, there were three different types of schools. Public schools in New England, church schools in the middle colonies, and private schools among the plantation owners of the South. In all of them, the Bible, or else the New England Primer, which is based on the Bible, was the book out of which everyone learned to read for nearly a century. All intelligent people became familiar with the great scriptural truth about the sacredness of the individual in the sight of God. Instilled in the minds of those who framed our Constitution was the idea that no one had a right to become a dictator because liberty was one of the inalienable rights which came from the Creator. Thus, back of our democracy is the Bible, the Word of God. Folks, this country is founded upon the Word of God. That's right. This Bible was not, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm not trying to be smart, like this Bible is not founded on the Koran. It was not founded on the Book of Mormon. It was not founded on the New World Translation Jehovah's Witness Bible. It was not founded upon any of the false cults, religious material, or publications. It was founded... <laughs> Upon the good old King James 1611 authorized yeah, version. Amen. Yeah, amen. I want to say that the blessing, another blessing of the Bible, 
is that it's a liberator. <clears throat> a liberator. Thomas Jefferson said, the Bible is the cornerstone of liberty. It's a liberator. The Bible is the cornerstone of liberty. I have always said, I always will say, Jefferson said, that the studious per use of the sacred volume, in other words, you reading and studying the Bible, will make better citizens, better fathers, and better husbands. Now, how much Bible reading do people in America do today? I'm not trying to be a smart dog. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. How much, I mean, folks, I'm going to tell you what, think about this. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm going to tell like it is. I heard, I seen something the other day. How did it say, I got to see if I can get this exactly right. Uh, uh, it said something like, have you read the Bible today as much as you have been on your cell phone or something like that? Or as much as you've been on Facebook? Think about that. Isn't that something? And then last of all, I want to say this. The blessings of the Bible. The Bible's a library. It's a landscape. It's a love letter. It's a listening post where we can go to hear the voice of God. It's a love letter addressed to mankind by the God of the universe. It's a law, number five, that tutors and teaches us the way of righteousness and the paths to avoid. It's a uh, light that gives guidance in the midst of the dark perplexities of life and the fog of confusion. It's a lifeline, a rope to which a drowning sinner may be pulled to eternal safety through Jesus Christ. And it's also not just for a sinner, but it's for a saved person, for us, to get comfort and hope and joy and peace of God and assurance from the Word of God. But then last of all, I got thinking about this. I put this one in there. The Word of God, the blessing of the Bible, it's a laser. Whoa! Glory to God. It's a laser. Now they do all this laser surgery now. They can uh, they can do eye, you know, eye, eye LASIK surgery. They can use a laser, you know, and, and to put uh, get rid of your cataracts and and uh, uh, different things, you know, uh, glaucoma and different things they can get rid of. I mean, great medical techn technological advancements in the last 30 or 40, 50 years. Thank God for that. They can do laser surgery on your I think, you know, parts of your body, your torso, you know, your back or the, the, the front here and so forth on different organs and so forth. And they got all kinds of things that are coming out with every year or two and uh, every four, five, six years and laser surgery. But I want to tell you what, this word of God did a laser surgery on me when I got saved. When I got born again in the Spirit of God, you say, well, it wasn't the word of God, it was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit with the word of God. I'll tell you what, a man was up preaching. He was preaching the Word of God, and the Holy Ghost of God came in there and did some laser surgery. We read in James 1, receive with meekness the engrafted Word, which is able to save your souls. Remember that? I won't, I won't turn to it for the sake of time, but we have in Acts chapter 9, Paul gets saved, Saul. His name's Saul. And in Acts 9, he struck down the road to Damascus, and, Damascus, and it says that he fell and he was trembling. He said, Lord, what, in Acts 9, verse 6, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He was under old-fashioned Holy Ghost conviction. You know what happened? He had laser surgery. Amen. God did some laser surgery on him. The Word of God. And, uh, and then uh, in Acts chapter 16, we have the Philippian jailer there. He gets saved in Acts 16. And he falls down at Paul and Silas' feet and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. But the Bible says in Acts 16, 29 and 30 and 31 there, he fell down trembling. I mean trembling under old-fashioned Holy Ghost conviction. That's what's missing in America. Old-fashioned Holy Ghost conviction. And then Acts 24 and, and verse 25, it says that as he reasoned, Paul preached a grown, full-grown man, Felix there. And as he reasoned of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come, Felix trembled and said, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. And no doubt, folks, Felix is burning in hell. You say, you don't know that. There's never a convenient time to get saved. The time to get saved is now. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. 
Proverbs 27 and verse 1. Hebrews 9, 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. After this, after death, judgment time. And so the, the Word of God, the blessing of the Bible, is it does a laser surgery on us. And so in Acts 26, Paul's preaching to King Agrippa. And King Agrippa's under old-fashioned Holy Ghost conviction, and Paul's kind of right down that chapter, right on down through the line there, and preaching the Word of God with the power and boldness of God, and preaching to a full-grown king named King Agrippa, and he gets at the end there in Acts 26, verse 28, and the Bible says that King Agrippa said, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. We get the song, Almost Persuaded. Almost. You almost did it, Paul. You almost did it. You almost convinced me. And no record given he ever got saved. That's sad. Felix, no record he got saved. Uh, King Agrippa, no record he got saved. Pilate, no record he got saved. And he dealt with Jesus Christ. He stood right there next to him almost. Sad characters in the Bible. Those are just a few. Sad characters. A national group of agnostics and atheists years ago, they wanted this true. They wanted a disclaimer on Bibles placed in the state-owned Indiana tourist rooms. The wording is suggested, this is what they want to put it on the Bibles. <clears throat> Warning, literal belief in this book may endanger your health and life. You say, who's that put out by a bunch of ungodly, filthy, wicked per perverts? The Freedom From Religion Foundation Incorporated, based in Madison, Wisconsin, and it's still there today as I speak. They go into different states and get rid of statues that's got the commandments on them, or anything that's got Bible, anything God, anything with the Word of God, anything that has anything to do with God, the Freedom From Religion Foundation Incorporated based in Madison, Wisconsin, will try to get rid of it. They ask Indiana officials to affix this message on Bibles that the Gideon Society is allowed to place in the state park inns. Inns, like motel inns. And they, this is what they wanted to put on Bibles. Warning, literal belief in this book may endanger your health and life. It won't endanger it. It'll help it. Amen. It'll help their lives. Besides save their souls from hell, they'll have a better life because Jesus said, I am come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. In John 10, verse 10, a black African woman was asked if she enjoyed reading her new Bible. And she replied, Sir, I'm not reading this book. This book is reading me. Amen. It's like a laser. It's like a laser surgery. Amen. I, I close with this. Mark Twain, he once commented that what bothered him about the Bible was not the things he did not understand, but the things he did understand. Amen. I went to his home up in the Hartford, Connecticut area there. In Hartford, Connecticut, years ago, they took me up. I, was preach, I preach up there every year. Hartford, Connecticut area outside of Hartford. And uh, and they took me there. I think it's downtown there. And they they, tell, they have a tour guide there. They take you through this house that he lived in or built or grew up in or something. I can't remember now. It was like 18 years ago. But anyways, uh, they, they tell you all this stuff about Mark Twain. He had a preacher friend that he'd go walking with occasionally. And he'd ask questions or two about the Bible. He'd ask questions about the Bible to this preacher friend. I think he's a Presbyterian or congregational minister or something like that. And uh, but he would ask him things about the Bible. And uh, I, I don't know, Mark Twain, some people say he, he got saved at the end. I don't know whether he did or not, but uh, you know, if he didn't, he's not in heaven. He's in hell according to the Bible. And that's a terrible thing. But he said, the thing that bothers me most about the Bible are not the things that I don't understand, but the things I do understand. Because that Bible, the blessing of that Bible is like a laser. It just comes in there. But I'm thankful that if we'll accept it and obey it and receive it, it's like a balm of Gilead, the Bible says. It's a balm 
of Gilead. And it'll cure you. It'll cure you. Amen. It'll convict you, but it'll cure you. Amen. And so this is some blessings of the Bible. Let's all stand if you would. We're going to get a song of invitation.